Open to John chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible with you, you can grab one in the seat in front of you. And if you don't own a Bible, please take that Bible home with you. Uh, we want to put God's words in everyone's hands. Let that be our gift to you. You guys are a friendly crowd, man. You guys, this was, I was like, I half expected to hear like a, like a champagne cork uh, a pop in the middle of uh, everybody exchanging, passing the peace and what have you. Anyways... We're going to be in John chapter 4, starting in verse 43 today. If you want to make your way there. So, one of the things that people often misunderstand about Christianity, I think, is the necessity of faith. Now, let me explain what I mean. What I mean is, it's not enough to simply know about the things that make up Christianity. According to the Bible, you actually have to trust in it. See, most people confuse knowing with believing. When they say, oh, I believe in Jesus, what they really mean is, oh, I know about Jesus. Like, I've heard of this guy. He, you know, died on a cross many years ago. He was a teacher, maybe had a beard. Like, they know a couple, they could, get te- they could describe you to him. But there's a difference between knowing information and actually putting your trust in what that information is. Or the person that that information is speaking of. So they're, they're, maybe they're okay with the idea of Jesus as a sin bearer. But they aren't willing to risk their life for it. And they certainly aren't willing to change their life for it. Guys, hear me out. That kind of belief that says, oh, I believe in Jesus, but goes about its life and is unchanged. That's not real belief. That's not real faith. See, we have to understand that Jesus makes claims that are so bold that it demands a response. This is why you can't hear the message and be unaffected by it. He said, uh, for example, in Mark chapter 8, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. If you really understand what he's saying there, guys, you just can't take it casually. No one here is take up your cross and follow me and goes, oh, okay. It, it requires us to consider it. It requires us to consider the cost and to f- figure out whether or not we actually believe it. See, the claims of the Bible are just too big to take lightly. We're told that we have to trust God more than our own understanding. We're told that we have to trust him and treasure him more than even our own life if it costs you that. If we actually believe this, there's no way we can be cavalier about our faith. Another way to say this is that lots of people who claim to be Christians really aren't, I think, convinced of the claims of Christianity. That is, they have an interest in Jesus. Even people in church often have an interest in Jesus, but they're not all in for it. See, if that's the case for you or for someone you know, good news Today's message is for you. So, here's the big idea. If you remember nothing else from this week, I want you to remember this. Jesus has provided all the evidence we need to trust in him. Let me repeat that. Jesus has provided all the evidence, evidence we need to trust in him. That is to say, there's something, if there's something holding someone back from believing in Jesus... Rest assured, it's not lack of proof. See, as we'll see from today's story, you can actually be focused on the signs and the proofs to the point where you actually miss out on what that sign is pointing to. Specifically, that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. So as we go through the story for this morning, I want you to ask yourself the hard question. Do I really believe this? And if so... What in my life needs to change? So, we're in John chapter 4 this morning. Uh, This is basically a bit of a, this is kind of the closing of uh, some of the sermons we've been going through up to this point. And so, it's helpful to do a little bit of catch up. So here, if you've missed some of the sermons, here's a Cliff Notes version for you uh, for today. John's gospel presents the story of how God came down from heaven, was born a man named Jesus, and brought eternal life. Jesus begins his ministry by performing the first, what we're told in John's gospel, is the first sign, which is a miracle at a wedding where he turned water into wine. 
Jesus encounters then a Jewish leader named Nicodemus and tells him that without being born again, you cannot have a part in God's kingdom. And then last week, Jesus traveled to Samaria, met a woman and revealed himself to her. And as a result, we read many Samaritans came to trust in Jesus, as they said, as the savior of the world. We pick up today in John chapter 4, verse 43. After the di two days, he departed for Galilee. For Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his hometown. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast. For they too had gone to the feast. Pause there for a second. Jesus coming off this successful mission to get to Samaria. So he went to Samaria. This is a people that would have been rejected, seen as outcast by the Jews. He went there and there was success. This woman who believed in him, she went and told others. They came out to see Jesus. And we read lots of, Samar of Samaritans came to believe in Jesus. So things are looking up for him right now. However, then he comes back to his, the, the area that he was generally more acquainted with, the region known as Galilee. A little bit about Galilee. Uh, Galilee is where most of Jesus' miracles take place. Um, it's also a place that in this time uh, that when this gospel was written was really a mixture of religions. So a little bit of history. In the 8th century, the Assyrians conquered Ga the area and as a result, a lot of the population there was actually non-Jewish. Uh, Matthew refers to this in his, his gospel when he calls it Galilee of the Gentiles. So this is a Jewish land that had a heavy Gentile presence in it. Let alone this is written during the time of the Roman Empire. And so there's a military presence that is not wanted in this area. So John tells that us something else about this. So Jesus, having all the success in Samaria, where they didn't know him, comes down to Galilee where they were familiar with him. And then he tells us what John tells us why. He says, a prophet has no honor in his hometown. That seems strange. See, when he enters Galilee, he's welcomed by them. In what sense then was he not welcomed? Like it seems like he was welcomed in his hometown here, right? Well, the author tells us uh, a little bit about this. He tells us that the Galileans had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast. That is, uh, one, that is when he was in Passover at, Passover, at the Passover feast. He turned the tables over, drove out the money changers, all those things. So they had already had evidence of who Jesus was. They had already familiar with his teaching. They were probably already familiar with some of his miracles. So they, got, they have more information about Jesus right now than the Samaritans that he had great success with the week that we studied last week had. Now they welcome him, but we read in John's, he, John had already told us earlier in chapter 2 that when, G, when Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, what happened is he said a lot of people believed in Jesus, but John chapter 2 verse 25, Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. So these are people who had, for lack of a better term, squishy kind of faith. They didn't have that real faith. They weren't all sold into this stuff. They lacked something that's important in true belief. They lacked a new birth. Instead, they were fascinated by Jesus. Jesus was a miracle worker. He was like, do you, I don't know if you guys remember, this was popular like probably 20 years ago now. Uh, but uh, when street magicians were like a big thing on TV and they're like, oh, this guy on the street and he levitates and all those things and people would flock to these street magicians. That's kind of the idea we have w with Jesus's reception in Galilee. He, these people are fascinated by him because he, you know, because he's done, he did miracles. He taught with authority, but what they had wasn't necessarily the kind of belief that makes up true belief as we'll see. Then we see a desperate situation happens. Verse 46. And as he came to Cana in Galilee, where he had made the water into wine, and at Ca uh, uh, Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. When this man asked Jesus, uh, heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So one of the ways we see this kind of bookending our section is that Jesus basically is going backwards on his trek. 
He went up this way, and now he's coming back down this way. Or it might be the other way. My maps are bad. Ask Red. He's better with maps than I am. But anyways, he's backtracking his journey he just went on. And so we to we're told he reached uh, this place, Cana, where he literally turned water to wine. So these people have seen, they know Jesus is the real deal in the sense that they should know. They're not lacking evidence. They saw him turn dirty water into the finest wine, okay? There's not, a, so then we're told that a person comes up to him, a nobleman or an official uh, who had a sick son. Now, this was meant probably, this, when it says he was an official, this guy probably worked for Herod, who was uh, the reigning king in that region at that time. Now, that he's called that tells us a little bit about this guy from the get-go. Uh, we're not told about this, this official's religious belief. We don't know if he was a Jew or a Gentile, but he was certainly viewed as an outcast by the Jewish population. If he was a Gentile, he would have been seen as a military presence that they didn't want in their land. And if he was a Jew, he would have been seen as a traitor because he worked for Herod. So much like the woman we looked at last week, this guy would have been somewhat as an, uh, as an outlier, not the likely person to see, you would see coming to Jesus. So we aren't told this man's name. We aren't told his religion. We aren't even told the specifics of his job. But we, aren't, but we are told one detail. His son was dying. What does that tell us? This guy was at the end of his rope. Jesus was probably not his first move, understand? Like he probably went, he, this guy was well off and well to do. He had probably taken his son to see different uh, physicians and things from the region. Jesus was probably not plan A for him, okay? He probably wasn't plan B either. But he was desperate. He says, my son is, di his son is dying, we will see. He was at the point of death. And so he goes to Jesus. He hears this news of this man who could perform miracles. He makes a decent trek down, and he finds it. So what's John showing us here? John's showing us something important, not just for the story, but for you and I. Most people don't come to Jesus until they are aware of their desperate need for him. So long as we think we can fix the problem on our own, whether it's the problem of our sin or the problem of our severed relationships with God or man, we'll seek out those means. We're a stubborn lot, guys. Relying completely on God doesn't come naturally. So this man's son is dying, which may, brings him face to face with something. Death is the great equalizer. Everybody dies, whether they're rich or poor. See, this official is confronted with the reality that even though he's a powerful man, even though he is probably a well-off man, he is still a man with limitations all the same. Guys, I've said this before and it bears repeating. All of the fear of COVID these last two years has shown us and a lot of people did, that a lot of people didn't take seriously that we all die someday. It's just something we're faced with. Verse 48. So he comes to Jesus, and then verse 48, Jesus gives this response, which is kind of odd, I'll be honest. It seems strange for Jesus to speak this way. He says, unless you see signs and wonders, will you not believe? A little bit about this. Something that gets lost in translation here is that the word you is actually in the plural. It's actually you all, or you people, or y'all, if you're more Southern. Basically, what he's doing here is addressing the, not just the man himself, but all the people around him, all the people in this region who are surrounded him, uh, that, are, that are around him. What he's saying is, unless you all see these signs and wonders, you're not going to believe in me. They wanted Jesus, what, what, so that's what's flawed with their faith. They were so dependent on just seeing one miracle after another, seeing signs and wonders and such. They already had proof that Jesus could do these things, but they lacked the faith to actually trust him. They wanted Jesus to do miracles, like I said, like a magician or something. But Jesus didn't come to do magic tricks, guys. Jesus knows these, this people's faith isn't real faith, but rather a fascination. However, in spite of this, what we see is that he shows his mercy and his grace to this man. 
Verse 49. The official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better, and they said to him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that the hour was when Jesus said to him, Your son will live. And he himself believed and all his household. Okay. Desperate, the man pleads with Jesus, Please, my son is dying. Notice he calls him sir here. This suggests that probably... This guy wasn't a a, a Jewish person, by the way. Uh, The Jews tend to address, when they want to be respectful to Jesus, they tend to say, Rabbi. Uh, Sir is a term he would have heard. He was an official. And so this is a a, a term he had probably heard, referred to him many times before, more so than he used it. Then Jesus tells him, go, your son will live. This is what makes this miracle unique. Sure. Jesus could go down with him. Everybody could follow along. They'd see, they'd see this sick boy. Jesus could like shake his hand, give him a hug, whatever, you know, rub his hands together and lay him on him or say, hey, get up. And then they'd all see him do it and they'd be like, oh yeah. But Jesus does something different here. And he does do that sometimes in the, in the gospels. He would actually go to the house. But here he doesn't. Here he goes, just head, head home. Your son's going to be fine. And so what he's doing here is he wants, why does he do this? He does this because he wants this man to believe his word. Notice verse 50. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went on his way. This is the person in the story we should identify with. Later in John's gospel, we will t- Jesus will tell one of his other disciples, Thomas, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have yet believed. The nobleman trusts Jesus on his word and leaves him and makes the long trek back home. As he's returning, one of the servants uh, comes to him to give him the good news. Your son's doing better. He's He's recovering. And so he asks him, when did he start feeling better? And they go, well, it was at the seventh hour. The seventh hour, by the way, is like one o'clock on uh, Jerusalem time. I don't know exactly the conversion rate. I had to look it up. But it's about one o'clock in the afternoon. And this guy knows, well, that's exactly when I was talking to this guy. That's when I was speaking with Jesus. And then John adds something really interesting at the end of the story. He says, he himself believed and all his household. Now, that's significant. Ask yourself an easy question, guys. How would this man's household believe? Short answer, because he told them. This is a reoccurring theme we find throughout John's gospel. People hear the word, believe the word, share the word. And the result is faith is replicated. Realizing that Jesus had just done a miracle, he went home and told his family the whole story. I'm sure he couldn't wait to tell them all of this. So don't miss out on that idea. This same theme we see of the word, com- word and witness is a great way to sum up the gospel of John. Jesus comes to us, the word made flesh who dwells among us, and as w- men and women receive it, they become his witnesses. This is true of all of us. But also, don't miss out who he witnesses to first. Who does he share the good news with first? His household. I was uh, recently at a conference uh, for pastors about two weeks ago, and I ran into an old professor of mine uh, from seminary. And I didn't have kids when I had took his class. And uh, he asked a little bit about, oh, how are you doing? No, I was like, oh, good, just caught up a little bit. And then he came out, uh, I, I saw him later, and me and my wife and our three kids were all eating dinner together. And he looked at me, and he goes, and he smiled, and he just goes, you've been busy since seminary. <laughs> I said, I guess you could put it that way. But then I remember he looked me dead in the eyes, and this is what he said to me. Remember, they are your first church. What did he mean? He meant that in the process of being a pastor, don't forget that your first responsibility is to teach your family about Jesus. Guys, that's true of all of us. 
It's really easy to think big picture about everything, reaching the world and everything. Understand evangelism starts in the home. It starts with those closest to you. So we've been talking a, uh, a lot about witnessing of the good news of Jesus lately. Let me tell you something. If you're going to start, start with those who know you. Start with those who are closest to you. Uh, one of the reasons also I think we don't tell people about Jesus as much is we probably don't start by telling those closest to us. Uh, we've been doing a helpful activity actually in our house this last week. Um, I've been going through, by the way, if you need help sharing the gospel with people, we have, or you want to know more about it, we have little pamphlets out there that explain the gospel real short. I've been going through with this with my kids this week and kind of just explaining it to them every day a little more and stuff. And we've talked about all the kind of mechanics of it. And it's been really cool. Let me give you another reason why evangelism needs to start in your home. Because your loved ones need to know the true gospel found in the word of God as apart from the false gospels they're going to hear outside in the world. So, quick story. Just last night I was hanging out with my kids and there was a knock on the door. And it was late at night and it was like so inopportune to like answer the door to be honest with you. Uh, I had been, I, there was a wedding, yeah, there was James and Tamara's wedding yesterday, it was great. I came home, I, was, I wore a suit, I bought a suit for the occasion, I was feeling great. I got home and I got my I don't want to answer the door clothes, which basically consists of like a ratty t-shirt and this thing that I call swarts, which is basically sweatpants that I cut off into shorts. <laughs> don't wear them out in public, but they're great for home. Anyways, I hear a knock on the door and I've got one kid who's like running around in his diaper and I answer the door and there's two gentlemen dressed spiffy that wanted to tell me and my kids about the gospel. And they said, would you like to hear about the gospel? I said, sure I would. As a matter of fact, we've been learning about the gospel all this week, haven't we, kids? So I stood with, there with my kids nearby and spoke with these gentlemen for probably 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes, before they had somewhere to go. And afterwards, I gathered... So these are their words, that's a quote. Afterwards, um, this is important. I gathered my kids together and I told them this. Guys... You know how we've been talking about the gospel this whole week? You know why we, I want you guys, you need to know this stuff? It's because there's a lot of people out there who use words like gospel and Jesus and grace, but they don't mean the same thing the Bible means when it says that. And so we study the truth so we can tell it apart from a counterfeit. That's what we do. And I said, so this, uh, and, I, you know, and these guys were, were sweet. I was sweet to them and everything. But because I loved them, we talked about it. And I said, this isn't the same thing. We don't believe the same thing. We're not talking the same Jesus. Folks, if we don't share the truth of Jesus with our household, there's no lack of witnesses out there who are, who are willing to give you and your family a false gospel that cannot save anyone. That's why we study this stuff. That's why we need to know it and to take it in ourself. So then our, we read in verse 54 that this was the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from, Ju from Judea to Galilee. The second sign, this is important. The numbers are, is important here. See, why does John call it a second sign? He doesn't keep tabs on every single, single miracle Jesus ever did. As a matter of fact... John says himself that there aren't enough books to contain everything Jesus did. He says there's not enough books to tell you everything that Jesus did. This is not written so that you would believe and have eternal life. Why does he only point out two signs? What's the significance? By the way, the first was turning water into wine. Well, in order to understand this, it helps to understand that the, the way Jews approached a claims. To prove something in court, there had to be at least two witnesses. Deuteronomy 19 says this, A single witness will not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. Only on the evidence of two witnesses or three witnesses shall a charge be established. Paul echoes this idea when he tells the church at Corinth, Every charge must be established by the evidence of two witnesses. See, verse 54 is John's way of saying that there is already sufficient witness. There is already sufficient evidence to trust in Jesus. 
Jesus made the boldest claims that anyone has ever made, and he demonstrated that his testimony was true. Therefore, they are without excuse for denying this message. Guys, don't miss the significance of this story. Jesus spoke a boy back to life, and he wasn't even in the same town as him. Ask yourself, who else does the Bible tell us spoke things into existence? God. He said, let there be light, and there was light. He said that there could be creatures. He said, let there be creatures, and there were creatures. Jesus said, your son will live, and he lived on his word. All the evidence points to Jesus being the Christ, God in the flesh. Since Jesus is God, it goes without saying that he doesn't play by our rules. However, that doesn't mean we shouldn't trust him. It's exactly the opposite. When we learn that this official's entire household believed, we realize that Jesus didn't save one boy's life here. He saved an entire household. This tells me something. A couple things. For one, Jesus expects faith to spread. This man believed, and so he shared it with people close to him, people he loved and cared about. He shared this miracle with his household, and as, res as a result, they came to faith. Also, Jesus' plans are not always what we would call safe. See, he used this, understand the gravity of this situation. He used this boy's near-death experience to bring the message of the gospel to his entire family. Why? Because desperate people know they need a savior. They probably weren't, didn't know they needed a savior prior to that. Last, and I'm going to borrow a phrase from J.C. Ryle here on this last idea. We see that Christ's word is as good as Christ's presence. This should bring us great confidence because just, because just as Jesus isn't physically here right now, standing with us, his power is no way limited by that. See, Jesus sends us out to be his witnesses. All we have is his word and his spirit and each other, and that is more than enough. The word is sufficient. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1, I am not ashamed of the gospel. That's the message of salvation. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Jesus sends us out with his word, and we, we see from this story, the word is powerful enough to save those who trust in it. Jesus has provided all the evidence we need to trust in him. For the people in today's story, it was the miracle of turning water into wine and raising a boy back to health by his word. For there is something greater he did to prove that we, that we can trust in him, though. He did, Jesus did something greater to prove that we can trust in him as Lord and Savior than turning water to wine or even healing a sick boy. He got back from the dead. He rose from the grave. And the book of, the book of Romans begins this way. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who is descended from David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness. How? By his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord. When Jesus rose from the dead, he gave proof positive that he was the son of God. Then, having risen from the dead, he sends you and I out with that very same power and the very same word out into the world. Now, here's my question. Is it going to work? You bet it is. Revelation chapter 19. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one who's sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, that's crowns. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. 
From his mouth comes a sharp sword, which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. The word of God is powerful, so much that Jesus himself is called by that name. It's the power of God to conquer the nations and to rule them. Church, understand that if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you lack nothing. You have everything you need to believe and be saved. You have everything you need to go out and conquer in the name of Jesus. You have his word. That would be enough. But he, doesn't get, but that, he gives you even more. Like I said, he gives you his word. He gives you his spirit, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. And he gives us each other, a family to build each other up and encourage one another, to hold each other up when we're struggling. See, this is God's plan. We receive the word, and then we go and share the word. And as we do this, the world is changed. People are saved. Glory to God. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the gift of the gospel, for the fact that your word is enough. Your word is powerful and sufficient, and all our hope is found in you. God, bring us to the point of desperation if we need to. Help us to rely on you completely. Help us to trust you in your word, and help us to share that word with others that desperately need to hear it. For we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.